me read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to read a verse from 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 to 16. And we're looking at a number of crucial Christian convictions. I've called them. We began this a week ago. And I want to talk today about convictions about Scripture. Let me read you 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. Paul says to Timothy, who he has left to give leadership to the church in Ephesus, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands upon you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And you say, why does Paul give him such instructions there to devote himself to scripture, to preaching, to teaching, to watch his doctrine? It's because in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, just over the page, he says, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And I think probably we live in such a day. There's never been so much non-biblical ideas being preached that were claimed to have some connection with Scripture. And I think this description of suiting their own desires, gathering around them a number of teachers to say what they want to hear. Well, let me talk about convictions that we hold about Scripture. Whatever else you consider the Bible to be, it is a remarkable book. Let me give you a few facts just to begin with. Of course, the Bible is more than a book. It is actually a library of books. The Latin word biblia, from which we get our word Bible, is a plural word. It means books. And of course, this book, the Bible, consists of 66 books altogether. 39 books that form the Old Testament, that is, all pre-Christ. Uh, 17 of them are historical books from the book of Genesis to the book of Esther. That gives you the historical story of the Old Testament. And then the rest of the Old Testament consists of books that actually fit into that historical sequence. There are five poetic books, uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and then 17 prophetic books. Twelve of them we call minor prophets, not because they didn't have much to say, but they're short. Four we call major prophets because they're long. And you say, that doesn't make 17. No, there's one extra, uh, which is really a poem. It's the book of Lamentations. It comes as a postscript after the book of Jeremiah. Those form the 39 books of the Old Testament. And basically, it is the story of Israel and God's dealings with the nation of Israel. The first 11 chapters... Uh, uh, of Genesis, set the sort of universal setting and then narrows down to God's call of one man called Abraham, a covenant God made with Abraham, and then the nation that came from Abraham, the nation of Israel. And the rest of the Old Testament basically is the story of keeping the right people in the right place for the right purpose. And if you get the wrong people in the right place, you get the wrong people out of the right place. You've got the right people who are not in the right place. You get them into the right place. And if you get the right people in the right place who forget the right purpose which they have put there, God has to discipline and correct them to get them back on track for their right purpose. Does that sound confusing? Well, that's the story of the Old Testament. Getting the right people in the right place for the right purpose and keeping them there. What was the purpose? Well, the purpose never materialized in the Old Testament. The Old Testament comes to an end and there's 400 years of silence. And then we get the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we get the whole purpose which God set apart the nation of Israel. 
that God would bring Christ, the Messiah, and through Christ, the church, there would be his agent to minister to the world. The New Testament consists of 27 books. Five of them are historical. The four Gospels and the book of Acts, 13 are epistles, letters of Paul, and nine are other letters written by other folks, Peter, James, John, Jude, and the unknown writer of the letter to the Hebrews. We're not sure who wrote that. But it's not a separate story. It's a continuation of the same story. Because you see, Abraham in the Old Testament was not an end in himself. God called Abraham that he might give to him a son from that son a family, from that family a nation. And that nation of Israel was not an end in itself. The promise to Abraham was that the seed of Abraham would be the means by which God would bless the world. Paul makes much of that in Galatians 3.16. The promises spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Sorry, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. And Israel's ultimate role was the means of bringing Christ. Romans 9 tells us that as well. But Christ is not an end in himself. The reason why Jesus Christ, God made flesh, became a human being, was that he might make provision for people to be reconciled to God, and that those who are reconciled to God, his church, might continue his work until every nation, every tribe, every tongue are incorporated into the church, which we find in the last two chapters of the Bible. We don't find this until the last two chapters of the Bible is actually his bride. The whole story is actually a romance. It's finding a bride for God's son. And in the Old Testament, Israel is the means through which the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, is brought. In the New Testament, Christ prepares a people, his church, and they end up at the end of Revelation being his bride. That's in a nutshell the story of the Bible. There's lots more in it, of course, but that's in a nutshell. And that is the primary story of the Bible is put together by about 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years. That means if the last part of the Bible is being written today, the first part would have been written back in the 5th century or the 6th century, around 1,500 years. It's a long period of time. It was written in three languages. The Old Testament is mostly written in Hebrew. There are some parts written in Aramaic and the New Testament written in Greek, which was the international language of the day. It was written on three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. In scores of situations, Moses wrote in the wilderness, Jeremiah and Paul wrote in prison, David wrote out on the hills, Solomon wrote in a palace, Ezekiel wrote in exile, John was also exiled on the Isle of Patmos in the Mediterranean, Mark wrote at his home in Jerusalem, Paul wrote on the road traveling around the Mediterranean world, Peter wrote facing persecution, they wrote in Umpteen different kinds of situations. It contains history, it contains poetry, it contains doctrine, it contains ethics, it contains prophecy. There are war stories and love stories and political intrigue and murders and assassinations and adultery and suicide. They're stories of people of faith, people of hope, people of love. If you want a good book to read, where else do you need to go? Huh. Everything's there. It's about origins, where we came from. It's about the future, where we're going to. It addresses the fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? How did I get here? Where am I going to go? Is there a future beyond this life? It runs from eternity past to eternity future. And it remains the world's best-selling book. Do you know today the Bible sells at a rate of 100 million copies every year? It is still the world's best-selling book. No list of bestsellers includes the Bible because they exclude it because no other book will get a look in. In fact, the Times of London wrote, forget modern novelists and TV tie-ins, the Bible is the best-selling book 
every year. If sales of the Bible were included in bestseller lists, it would be a rare week when anything else would, would achieve a look-in. It is wonderful, if not weird, that in this godless age, this one book should go on selling every month at the rate at which it sells. You say, what's 100 million copies? If they were all the size of my Bible here, it's 24 centimeters long, I measured it yesterday, and you were to put 100 million of these Bibles end to end, they would stretch 240,000 kilometers. It's useless information, isn't it? That is six times around the equator of the world. That's how many Bibles sell every year. And there's something like 500 million portions of the Bible, New Testaments, Gospels, that sell every year as well. Problem is, it's probably the least read bestseller. Probably no other book sits so motionless on the bookshelves of the world. And perhaps even sits so motionless on Christian bookshelves. But the fact remains, it continues to sell above every other book. Well, with that as the background, let me talk about two things. I want to talk about the authority of Scripture, and I want to talk about the inspiration of Scripture. Let me talk first about the authority of Scripture. Every movement has an authority at its Source. In fact, that's an important question to ask of any organization that you want to know anything about. Where does the authority lie in the organization? The buck has to stop somewhere. Now, we can say, of course, that God is the authority ultimately in the universe because God is sovereign, and that is true. But how does God express his sovereignty, his mind, his will? The Christian answer is that he does so through Scripture. And in fact, our understanding of the authority of Scripture is the dividing line in the major movements of Christendom. Because within Christendom, not everybody sees Scripture as the authority. Let me just give you the three main positions and their other within Christendom. Let me first give you the, the Catholic position because Catholicism is the largest body within Christendom. They claim 1.1 billion members. By that, I think the definition is baptized members. That's approximately one in six of the world's population. And the principal authority in the teachings of the Catholic Church are actually threefold. Number one, top of the list, is the sacred scriptures. But how do you understand? I'm quoting there, that's their term, the sacred scriptures. The second is sacred tradition, by which you interpret the sacred scriptures. And the third authority according to Catholicism, is what they call living magisterium, which is the authority of the Pope and the bishops who serve in union with him. So how they approach scripture and how they approach doctrine, should I say, is this. They, they say first about any doctrine, what does the scripture say? That's a reasonably straightforward question, but how do you interpret what the scripture says? Because sometimes it's a little ambiguous. Many times it's a little ambiguous. And so they ask the second question, what has the church said? You see, the word Catholic, as I'm sure you, you know, means universal. And the understanding of the Catholic church is not just universal in its breadth, that is that the church in Africa and the church in Asia and the church in America is all one church, but also Catholic in depth. That is, that the church of the first century and the church of the 21st century and the church of the 15th century and the church of the 6th century and every one in between is all part of the one church. And where the church has already made edicts, where it has already formulated doctrine, where it has already observed practices, where it has already stated 
ethics, those remain authoritative today because we're one church and we cannot adjust them and move them to suit our own peculiarities of our own day. That's why there's great stress on apostolic authority and apostolic succession because they want to stress the unity of the church in every generation. And that's why Roman Catholic doctrine, by and large, is pretty unrelenting. They take a very firm stand on issues like birth control and issues like abortion and uh, the celibacy for priests and for nuns and so on, simply because they cannot change these things that have already been pronounced on in the church historically. Now, of course, there's some value in history and tradition. We are part of one holy Catholic apostolic church, as the Apostles' Creed states. We do belong to its history. We don't keep on reinventing in every generation the wheel of doctrine. We accept many conclusions of history. We accept the canon of scripture that was uh, pretty universally agreed on by the middle of the third century. And we don't every generation say, which books do we think ought to be in the Bible? We accept the uh, canon that was basically recognized. It wasn't decided on. It was recognized as being inspired by the Holy Spirit for various criteria that were used, although there was disagreement about what we call the Apocrypha. The Roman Catholic Church includes the Apocrypha. We don't readdress it every generation. We have things like uh, the Nicene Creed, which explains how the deity and the humanity of Christ are separate yet one, and uh, these are important issues, but we don't re-debate those issues. We accept the debates of history or the formulations of the Trinity, which were agreed on back in the fourth century in the Creed of Athanasius. We don't re-debate uh, those things. Normally we accept those, so there is valid value, of course, in history and tradition. But the question is, which in the event of a dispute is the more important one? Now, this is where Protestantism parts come with Catholicism, where tradition is the means by which we interpret Scripture. The third question they ask, what does Scripture say? What does the Church say? And the third question is, what does the Pope say? And they base this on Jesus' words to Peter, you are Peter, on this rock I'll build my church, and a further understanding that Peter subsequently went to Rome, became the bishop of the church in Rome, and when he died, it was passed on to his successor, and they changed the name from bishop to pope eventually, and the authority given to Peter, as they understand that statement to Peter, is one which has been passed on to the next generation. And in the course of time, it's developed into the idea of papal infallibility. Let me quote you from a Catholic uh, statement here. The papal infallibility is the dogma that by action of the Holy Spirit, the Pope is preserved from even the possibility of error when he solemnly prom uh, promulgates or declares to the church a dogmatic teaching on faith or morals. Now, it's interesting, this doctrine was not defined until the First Vatican Council in the year 1870. They got on for 1,800 years without uh, papal infallibility, but now he has this privilege of being the final word on issues of uh, faith and morals. Mind you, the Pope doesn't speak infallibly very often. I think I'm right in saying the last Pope never declared anything infallibly to be new and fresh, but back in 1950, the Pope then uh, did declare that Mary's assumption into heaven was an article of faith for the Catholic Church and has been accepted ever since. Now, those of us who are not Catholics say, hey, just hold on, where in the world is that even suggested in Scripture? But the point is that they have attributed on the basis of the words of Jesus to Peter and on the assumptions they make about Peter's position subsequently that this is an authoritative uh, statement and dogma. So, so that is the um, position of, of, of the Catholic Church. The Orthodox Church, some of you have an Orthodox background, I know, uh, 
is, is, is similar. They say that the church embodies the Christian faith and the church formulates, defines, and pronounces truth. Uh, where there is any dispute, the fathers of the church assemble in synods to discuss the disputed points and to decree and interpret the correct meaning of these truths, but their decisions, uh, when made, are infallible. So it's a little bit similar to the Catholic doctrine, but it, it is more uh, a plurality of discussion and decision made about that. Well, in the 16th century, there was a massive revolt against papal authority in particular. And this brought about what we know as the Reformation. And Luther's cry, as many of you know, was, let's get back to Scripture alone. In fact, at the time of the Reformation, sola scriptura, which is Latin for Scripture alone, was the main cry of the Reformers. In fact, they had four solas as they became known. Sola scriptura, the Bible alone. Sola Christus, Christ alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, by faith alone. These were the four solas of the Reformation. Now, most of us, and probably most of us here, will see this as being a getting back to Scripture, and it was a reasserting the sovereignty and the sufficiency of Scripture alone in matters of faith and doctrine. That leads to the second position. The first was the Catholic position. The second position is, I'm going to call it the evangelical position. Uh, really, it was the Protestant position, but Protestantism then divided later, so we call it the evangelical position. And I want to read you a definition of sola scriptura. It is the assertion that the Bible as God's written word is self-authenticating, clear to the rational reader, is its own interpreter, that is you interpret scripture by scripture, and it is sufficient of itself to be the only source of Christian doctrine. Now, that was the cornerstone of the Reformation, and it was a huge, huge change. Anyone who could read and understand Scripture was free to interpret it as their understanding allowed them to without having to look for an official interpretation. Now, of course, this has to be done with discipline. Scripture interprets Scripture is what uh, was taught in the Reformation. And uh, we need to read and interpret Scripture with due diligence and integrity and discipline. We can't say it means anything just because one verse suggests something. We must interpret it all within its context. However, the impact of the Reformation set the church, at least the Protestant church, free from the, the official interpretation from above and gave people the liberty to think for themselves and read for themselves. Now, the effects of that were very far-reaching. If you went to anyone in Europe before the Reformation, and you asked them the question, what is truth? They would answer, truth is what God says. If you then said to them, how do you know what God says? They would answer, you know what God says by what the church says. What God says is what the church says. That was the understanding before the Reformation. After the Reformation, if you went to somebody in Europe and said, what is truth? They'll give you the same answer initially. Truth is what God says. But when you ask them, well, how do you know what God says? Europe divided into two. Half would say, what God says is what the church says. The other half would say, what God says is what the Bible says. If you then ask the question, what does the Bible say, you began to get different answers. Protestantism quickly moved in lots of directions. You had Lutheranism. You had Zwingliism. Zwingli was the Swiss reformer in Zurich, preached in a big church called Grossmünster. I've been there a couple of times. And uh, he differed from Luther on certain things. You had Calvinism. Calvin was a Frenchman who preached primarily in Geneva. You have Presbyterianism, which was basically Calvinism. You had Episcopalianism. You had the Anabaptist movement afterwards that came along. 
began to re-baptize people and began to teach the baptism of believers only as opposed to the standard understanding before that of baptism of, uh, of, of children. And Protestantism quickly began to fragment on the basis of people's understanding of Scripture. Well, well that's okay, of course, because we allow, there are some ambiguities. But the Reformation had another big effect too. It released people to begin to think for themselves. And for a thousand years before the Reformation, there was very little fresh thinking. It's called by historians the Dark Ages because between the 6th and the 16th century, there seemed to be very few new thoughts, very little change. Europe in particular, where of course this whole debate went on, was pretty static for a thousand years. The Reformation released a logjam, opened people to begin to think for themselves, and that led to what we call the Enlightenment, which ushered in the scientific age and uh, exploration and rationalism, which leads to the third position on Scripture, which is the liberal position. The Catholic position is Scripture is interpreted by tradition, the evangelical position is the scripture is interpreted by itself. The liberal position became scripture is interpreted by reason. Now, people trace the Enlightenment to different particular sources, but probably Descartes, René Descartes, who was a French mathematician, he was Catholic, but probably he was a key figure because Descartes was concerned about how do we know what is true? And... Uh, he came along a century after Luther, and he set out to doubt everything that could be doubted. If you can doubt anything, doubt it and see what you're left with. And, Ray, uh, and Descartes got back to one single starting point. It's a famous saying, I think, therefore I am. That was Descartes' beginning. And he began to rebuild a worldview based purely on what you could see and touch and taste and smell and feel and prove. That became the key word, prove it. And by the 19th century, that had become known as modernism. It permeated every part of society and culture, including the church. And it began to subject the Bible to the criteria of human re reason. All truth is God's truth, quote, unquote became a statement, so scripture's true, yes, but so lots of other things. Interpret scripture in the light of reason and science and uh, new discoveries. And so things like higher criticism of the text of scripture. How do you know that Paul really wrote First Timothy, which I just read from to you? How do you know that these really are the words of Jesus in the Gospels? What is our reason outside of scripture for knowing that and establishing that? And in the course of time, you know, it's ethical teaching, moral absolutes ceased to be, they became relative, miracles became questioned, the biblical account of creation was rejected, and this had its biggest influence in the mainline denominations, and not surprisingly, they're the ones who then lost in the Christianized world many, many people over this past century or century and a half. In fact, it's an important observation, those churches and denominations that, that undermine the authority of Scripture without exception are on the decline. Without exception, because they have no message left. And those who do so will decline, and those who come back to the affirmation of the authority of Scripture and the truthness of Scripture, whether you can prove it or not, are the ones who will see growth and see the Word of God do its work in people's lives. Let me give you one instance of this. Back in 1949, Billy Graham had been invited to conduct a crusade in Los Angeles. He was not famous, it was Los Angeles Crusade that made him famous, the Christ for Greater Los Angeles Crusade, and prior to the crusade, he and a group of, te and a team of colleagues met at a place called Forest Home, about an hour outside of Los Angeles, and one of his colleagues was uh, Charles Templeton, known to many of you because he was a Torontonian, of course, became editor of 
Maclean's and the broadcaster. Charles Templeton being himself and a very effective evangelist. He'd worked with Billy Graham. They traveled to Europe together, preaching together. And then he'd gone to a particular seminary, which I won't name, and had begun to doubt the authority of Scripture. And he told Billy Graham at Forest Home, your view of Scripture is naive. You need to take time and study and uh, see uh, which parts of Scripture are trustworthy and which may be less trustworthy. And Billy Graham was greatly troubled by this, and he found himself unable to answer the arguments that were being presented to him. And he tells, they went out alone one night in the trees and found a stump of a tree, and he knelt by the stump of the tree, and he prayed to God words to this effect. He said, God, I don't know how to answer these challenges to the authority of Scripture. I can't prove this is the Word of God. I don't always understand it. But by faith, I'm going to accept that this is true. I'm not going to defend it. I'm simply going to preach it. And he went down to Los Angeles Crusade and began his famous uh, slogan. Billy Graham in his heyday used to often say, the Bible says. Do you remember that, those of you who remember him in his, his heyday? The Bible says. No attempt to justify it. And God moved with unusual authority in that Los Angeles meeting planned for three weeks. Added another week, another week. Eventually stayed there. I think it was about 10 or 11 weeks. And uh, a great movement of God took place in Southern California, caught the imagination of the press and media. And Billy Graham's name became a household word across North America and subsequently across the world. But Billy Graham would tell you the turning point came when he said, although I don't understand it, I'm going to accept the authority of this book and preach it as true. Sage Spurgeon, of course, used to say, why defend the Bible? That's like saying, he said, why defend a lion? I'd rather let the lion loose than try to defend it. Hmm. Let the scripture loose. Our position is that of the reformers, that scripture is the final authority in matters of faith and doctrine. It is also sufficient for us. What the Bible doesn't tell us, we don't need to know. What the Bible is not clear about, we don't need to be dogmatic about. I think it was John Stott who said that it is important for we as Christians to say with humility, I do not know about things where Scripture is silent or unclear, as it is for us to say with authority, I do know where Scripture has stated itself clearly. And there is a, a verse in Deuteronomy 29, 29, which says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There are secret things that belong to God that he's not revealed to us. But they're things which he has revealed. They are for us. They're for our children that we may follow them, he says, Deuteronomy 29, 29, and proclaim them. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. And those who undermine it die spiritually in the process. The movements that undermine it die in the process. And those who affirm it find that it is a spiritual force. Let me comment secondly on the inspiration of Scripture because the Bible is not authoritative because of its content. It is authoritative because of its origin. It is from the mind of God. Scripture's own testimony is that. Where in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed is the literal way to translate that, or given by inspiration of God. This doesn't mean the scripture is inspiring, though it is, but scripture is itself a divine product. It comes to us from God. Now that is only explicitly stated a few times, but the assumption is contained all the way through the Bible. I just put, I punched into my online Bible the words, the word of the Lord. And it came up 230 times. You know, the word of the Lord came to so-and-so. 
Abraham, Abijah, Jehu, Elijah. Or it says, the word of the Lord came through. It says that about Joshua. Or the word of the Lord spoken by this person or that person. Or the word of the Lord was with him. Or such and such a statement according to the word of the Lord. Or as in the Psalms, many, the word of the Lord is true and trustworthy 230 times. I, I say that because the assumption simply in that statement is, this is the word of God. So a couple of times explicitly says scripture is given by inspiration of God, but it is implied many, many times by the fact that what I'm bringing, the writer says, comes from God. It's God speaking. Second Peter 1.21 says this, prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There is a human authorship, of course. There is a dual authorship. There is a human authorship. You know, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, the prophets, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, etc. They all wrote, and if you read it with discernment, you find that there are characteristics of Paul, for instance, that are common in his writings that are not the same with Peter. You find something of the personality of the writer coming through. It's not that God dictated from heaven. You know, that when Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy, you know, he wasn't sitting down and heard from heaven. Write down this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Jesus Christ, our hope. You got it? Can you spell every word there? Okay, let me say it again. No, no. When Paul wrote letters, he didn't necessarily know he was writing scripture. When he wrote to the Philippians, I'm sure if he knew he was writing scripture, he would have left out about those two women in Philippians 4 who were squabbling and saying, just sort yourselves out and behave and get back into the real action. He probably thought, well, I better not mention that because that's going to be in scripture forever and ever. <laughs> but they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the remarkable thing is, although I've mentioned to you that script was written over 1500 years by 40 authors in three languages on three continents and every kind of context there is a remarkable unity that runs right the way through and it's revelation of god of christ of human beings and the purpose of life you know if people don't want to get into discussions they say don't talk about religion or politics <laughs> And yet all these authors over this long period of time, there is a unity that runs through. Why? Because the Holy Spirit carried them along by the Holy Spirit. Now it can be said, this is a circular argument if you say Scripture is inspired because Scripture says it is inspired. You know, what kind of objective proofs have you got? Well, what kind of proofs do we want? I don't know if there are such things, but there are certainly evidences. Look at the prophecies of the Old Testament. Many of them. Uh, I'm told there's 333 separate prophecies in the Old Testament. And I remember saying on one occasion that uh, the chances of 333 prophecies being fulfilled in one person were one in 83 billion. I got that from somebody else. It didn't work out. Somebody else came to me who was a mathematician. This was here at People's Church and said, no, no, you're way off. I'll tell you next week how many it is. And he gave me a long figure that was billion, 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 billion. So anyway, it's a lot. <laughs> And I don't know what the figure is because I don't know how to pronounce it even. But, but you look at some of those prophecies. Remember the Old Testament was, was finished before Christ was born. And yet it tells us very specific details about him, including the place of his birth and the nature of his birth. Nobody has any control over that. There are even apparent contradictions. You know, as to where Christ is going to come from, Micah says he'll come from Bethlehem. Hosea says he's going to come from Egypt. And Isaiah says he's going to be called a Nazarene. And in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew says, all these three things came to pass. He was born in Bethlehem by a sheer fluke, because his home was in Nazareth. His parents lived in Nazareth. It just happened to be there was a census. They just got there the very night that he was born, because you remember, he was born in the stable. Had Jesus been born 24 hours earlier, he would have been born in Samaria. They're only there to get counted in the census, maybe visit a few relatives, because Joseph came from Bethlehem. And then probably their intention was to head back home to Nazareth, but instead they were told to go down to Egypt to avoid the wrath of Herod. When Herod died, they came back and made their base in Nazareth. And yet it just so happened that 800 years before, 
Micah says, in you, Bethlehem, and he talks about how that in Bethlehem the Messiah would come. And out of Egypt I called my son, says Hosea, also 800 years before. I mean, the remarkable accuracy of Old Testament prophecy about Christ himself. I remember reading Isaiah 53 to a man one day. And uh, I said, who do you think this is about? And you know Isaiah 53, which is a graphic description of death by crucifixion. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. I said, who do you think that's about? He said, well, it's about Christ. How do you know? Well, it's obvious because, you know, that's what you folks believe about Christ. I said, do you know when it was written? No, I don't. It's written 700 years before Christ was ever born. Psalm 22, written 1,000 years before Christ was ever born. It talks about crucifixion. And it even says, you know, uh, that dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men have encircled me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, people stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. This is an exact description of what went on when Christ was crucified. And when he cried from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the opening line of this psalm. He was saying, Psalm 22. You know, they didn't call it Psalm 22 in those days. They called psalms by their first line in the way that we know hymns by their first line. You know, let's sing standing on the promises. We know it by the first line. And when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As well as that being true to what was happening on the cross, he was also saying to the people around, go and read Psalm 22. If they went home and read Psalm 22, their hair would have stood on end. It's an exact description of what we've just witnessed, and it was written a thousand years ago. If you met, if you... Uh, picked up a newspaper that gave you next week's news and you read it and next week it happened exactly as it had said this week, you'd probably want to meet the editor, wouldn't you? Huh. Where did this information come from? And the reason why it's important that we recognize the authority of Scripture is this, and I'll finish with this. Do you notice that the first thing Satan ever said in the Bible is the thing he has probably said most frequently since. He was speaking to Eve and he said this, did God really say? That was the first thing Satan ever said and he's still saying it. Did God really say? Because that is still the most important question to us. And by the way, if we do not know what God has said, we will not know how to respond to Satan. Did God really say? And actually, Eve misquotes God, if you remember. God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. He didn't say that you mustn't touch it, so she adds to what he said. It makes the sound very different. But this questioning and this distortion which led to confusion is how Satan attacks us. That's why when Satan attacked Jesus in the wilderness, do you remember what Jesus said on all three temptations? He simply answered this way, it is written. Satan's question to Eve, did God really say? Jesus answered to Satan, was not to discuss the issue, it is written. Turn these stones into bread. He didn't say, no, because I haven't finished with my 40 days, or no, I don't like stone bread, or whatever. He simply said, it is written. End of story. God has spoken about this. The issue is settled. Now, convictions about Scripture is not just that it is authoritative, not just that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, not just that it is sufficient for us, but that it is imperative that we read it and we digest it so that we might know the mind of God. Let me read you Colossians 3, verse 16. I could read you, I've got a number of verses here, and I'll just read you this one. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It has to get into you to dwell in you 
And David wrote, you know, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 11. Not your word have I hidden in my head even, but in my heart, the very core of my being, that I might not sin against you. If we believe in the authority of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture, we need to make it a priority that we know Scripture and read it, that through the written word, we of course know the living word, which is its primary revelation. Charles Spurgeon said of John Bunyan, who was the author of Pilgrim's Progress, Spurgeon said of Bunyan, prick him anywhere and you will find that his blood is bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his soul is full of the word of God. What a great testimony to somebody. And our conviction is the scripture is not just in some abstract way true, it is actually food for the soul. As we read it, meditate on it, and allow it to dwell richly in our hearts. So if these are crucial Christian convictions, the foundation of all our convictions is our convictions about Scripture. Because if Scripture is not reliable, if it's not true, nothing else that you believe can be held with certainty unless you know this is its source and it's given to us by God himself. Let's pray together and thank him that we have his word. Lord, we're so grateful that through the word of God, we meet the mind of God. And through the mind of God, we meet the heart of God. We can't fathom his mind. We can only just grasp that little of what you've revealed to us in such terms that we may understand them. We want to know your mind. We want your word to dwell in us richly. We might know your heart that comes to us through your word. We might know what is true, what is real, what is lasting, and know what is unreal, what is transient. When we are seduced by all the attractions of this world, that we will discern what is lasting and real and true and important. Because our minds and our hearts have been fed with your truth. Give us an appetite for your word, I pray. In Jesus' name.